Hi and welcome to my channel, I'm Simon and today I'm back with, you might not believe it because it's been so long since there's been one, but I'm back with a reading wrap up video. Who knew that was going to happen? But finally it has. As I mentioned last week, um, I am doing No Nonsense November. And one of the things that has been causing me nonsense in my own head more than anywhere else is wrap ups. I don't know why, because I really enjoy them and I really love watching them. So I don't know where I've got so out of kilter with it myself. But I think I had this last year from about August until December when I suddenly did like a wrap up of the second half of the year. I'm not going to do a wrap up of all the months that I missed. Um, I think I maybe have only done two or three wrap ups this year so far. But they will be back in 2022. And what I said in my No Nonsense November video, which if you missed I'll, is, well, the previous video to this or the one before that. It was a vlog actually for the last one. Um, which I'd love more of you to go and watch. Bernadine Everisto's in it. Armistead Morpan's in it. My Mother's in it, Chris is in it, everyone's in it. So let's not waffle anymore, let's get on with it because I thought I didn't have any books to talk to you about, but I do. And this does illustrate, I think, partly where my reading has gone slightly off kilter this year in the fact that I'm reading so much for work at the moment. And I've always said for years and years, like reading is like 20% and for work and the rest is for pleasure. And this year it kind of, I think maybe last year I said that, but realistically it was probably like 40% reading, 60 for pleasure. And then this year I think it's got to about 30% reading what I want to, not, not that reading for work isn't pleasure. Blimey, I'm going off on a few tangents, but anyway, yeah. Hi everyone, this is Simon from the future. Just interrupting to say the lighting does go a little bit do lally. It's like, the spirits did not want me to make this video, but instead of stopping and starting and doing it at another point, I thought, no, I'm going to do it today and I'm going to get on with it. So that's just your forewarning that it'll end up looking a bit like this later on. So yeah, back to me when it's a little bit brighter. Right, so enough waffle, let's get on with the books. No more procrastinating. First up, Bimini Bomboulash's Release the Beast, which is less a memoir of theirs and more kind of, uh, well, as it says on the tin, a drag queen's guide to life. So through 10 different chapters, through the things that Bimini has learned throughout their life so far, be it from um, fashion, be it from uh, LGBTQIA plus themes, be it gender, be it all sorts of things. And in, what I love about this book is that I love a list and there's quite a few lists in here of like Bimini's favourite uh, queer people from the past and um, that we should know more about whether it's like talking about their favorite outfits on drag race which i absolutely love them on and wanted them to win um so yeah i read this to do an event with bimini who was an absolute treat i was a little bit nervous i don't know why um but um yeah they were fantastic and this book also really made me think and want to go off and read a lot more and i love a book that comes with lots of recommendations for like resources and what else to read and stuff. And this book has that, I'm trying to find it now, in absolute abundance. So there's loads of further reading that you can do. I should say there's also lots of brilliant um, illustrations in here as well. And yeah, I just thought it was utterly, utterly wonderful. So I uh, can't recommend it enough. And I think it's one of those books you can really escape into. You can also put it down and, and have a bit of a break to think about things and then head back to it, or you can kind of binge it. It's just, yeah, it's phenomenal. Then for another work gig, which was the Gordon Byrne Prize. The next three books that I read were for that. In fact, you know, I need to move them around because one of them took me a while to read because it was essays and I read actually some uh, fiction in between. Anyway, um, Gordon Byrne Prize. Um, I was hosting the event, so I had to read all of the books by all of the authors. I'd already read uh, Jenny Fagan's book. I'd already read Doreen the Griefer's um, book, and I'd already read Selena Godden's book. So there were three that I hadn't read. The first of which was Come Join Our Disease by Sam Byers, which was a book that got postponed from 20 or put back from 2021 because of the pandemic and was one that I really was really keen to read because I really loved Sam's first book. I have his second one on the shelves and this does slightly link into it. So um, I'm really, really keen to get to that one too. Anyway, this is about Maya. I hope I've said that right. Is it Maya or Maya? Maya, yeah. And Maya is um, homeless. She's living a really tough life. And then she gets off with this opportunity for everything to change. And all she has to do is to Instagram her experiences as she goes to work and kind of be the face almost of well-being. And then things change because Maya begins to become less and less comfortable with what's going on and feel more and more used. And so she starts a anti well-being movement and it's a really fascinating look at mental health and how social media kind of has come into play with all of that but how 
it's portrayed in the press and the media and it's really powerful. I will say this book occasionally revels in how almost gross it can be, but I think not in a voyeuristic or sensationalist way. It's actually trying to prove a point, but it does... It, you do need to kind of greet teeth and go with it occasionally. Um, but I thought it was fantastic. And yeah, I would I would definitely recommend it. It's an interesting look at society now. And one that actually is a book I have not heard enough people talking about. So um, we have that one. Then for the prize, I read Sea State by Tabitha Lasley, which is a book I hadn't heard of. But as soon as I found out more about it, I was like, oh my goodness, this sounds incredible. This is all about Tabitha who as a journalist goes out to go and investigate what's going on with oil rigs and kind of how there are stories about people being so isolated on oil rigs that they can't, well it can affect their mental health, so the mental health um, again, but also it, um, it, it's how people are dealing with loneliness in terms of mental health, also suicide. Um, and so she goes out there and she kind of becomes embroiled within those places and that culture in a way that's really unexpected but in a way that she tells you so frankly like she ends up in this having an affair with one of the men who's not particularly nice to her and also already has a partner and yeah it, it's a really no nonsense no nonsense november um non-fiction book that's quite unlike anything i've read before and uh, yeah i thought it was pretty brill so um yeah it's 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 a hard one to describe. I do feel a little bit with these three because I had to read them very, very under quite tight conditions. I didn't have enough space to kind of let the books breathe within me. So they might be ones that I head back to actually on audiobook because, yeah, I do think they're great. Then I turned to some fiction and I have to say, this is a book that I've been a bit snobby about. I'll be really, really honest. It's Where the Cruel Dad Sing by Delia Owens. And we got Delia um, kind of last minute um, as a guest on the Sky Isles book club um and you know it's really real but it's like coup to get her because obviously this book has sold millions and millions and millions of copies and it's been an absolute bestseller over five million copies in fact it's on the front it's also one of andy's favorite books and i know pip has really 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 loved this and um, but i've just been a bit like mm, because i know there was some controversy about the author and the book and sort of a crime that it was based on I haven't looked into it enough, so possibly I've just heard some sensationalist nonsense. But that kind of, it's interesting, based on being frank about how, it's interesting how frank I'm being, and I don't mean like that, but it's, I'm being frank in saying that it's interesting that lots of different things can sway how you feel about a book and how you come to it. And I just felt a bit mm about this. Anyway, I thought it was really, really good. It's set in, I'm gonna get this wrong, it's the 1960s, isn't it? Yes, in the 1960s. And it's set in marshland, so for some reason I kept picturing parts of Britain that I know, even though I know it was meant to be uh, in America. Um, and it's about Kai, who sees this marsh girl, her family, most of them have fled. Um, they live on the outskirts, they're incredibly poor, they're very othered, um, very much like actually the black people of the area who, you know, live in their own specific area they have been so othered, um, which was obviously um, the case at the time, and that's horrific to read about. Um, but it's how she becomes sort of um, entwined in a sort of, not a, a threesome, that's wrong, but like how she catches the attention of two men, well, two boys, Chase and Tate. And at the beginning of the book, you know that Chase is dead. Now, I will say in terms of the crime, I kind of figured it out quite early on. Um, and whilst in many ways that was quite satisfying, because I was like, oh, I kind of felt like there could have been a bit more to it maybe that would throw me a tiny but i'm not saying that i need every crime novel to have twists and turns but that's what i felt about this anyway there's that but what i thought was so wonderful about this was the nature writing which i didn't realize delia owens is really really known for and i thought the way she wrote about the place and the creatures and the wildlife and the way of life and living off the earth which kyra is it kyra or kyla kaya has to do um was so beautiful for me it was worth it for that frankly so yeah I did enjoy the story it is a bit kind of romance as well um not necessarily one offered fodder and I don't know why I have been so sorry about it because it is really really good I will admit I found it a little bit predictable too so there we go then we have A Little Devil in America by Hanif um Abdurakib and this is in praise of black performance. And this is a collection of essays all about black culture. And I thought this was incredible, not only because 
I got a real insight into some of the famous black people I'd heard of, but also the ones that I didn't. But also I just think he writes essays in a really different way. And this is definitely, again, I read it in quite a condensed uh, amount of time. I will definitely be heading back to these and reading them slowly over time because I just thought they were brilliant, not only in terms of the subject matter, but also just in how they were written. I think he is phenomenal. So I was really, really chuffed that he won. The only thing I said about was he wasn't there so I could kind of say how amazing that I thought the book was to him directly although I did slip it in um, in the show as it were. Anyway let's move on from me and my dirty 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 double entendres and innuendos and on to two more books for the Sky Arts Book Club which I have to say sadly I didn't really enjoy this one that much like I read through it I read it really quickly but I didn't feel like it was anything new. And that is, sorry, it's going dark. This is typical. I finally get around to filming one of these and it's going dark. Um, this is William McIlvany um, and Ian Rankin, but really it's Ian Rankin writing as William McIlvany who died. It's an idea that he'd had about his detective, Ladlaw. Um, it's The Dark Remains. It's meant to be, sorry, Laidlaw's first case. It's set in Glasgow. I really like Glasgow as a city. It's a crime novel about gangs. I couldn't give two figs about gangs. I find in any book it really, really boring. And this was the case suddenly with this. I was just bored. I kind of like the almost um, psychic powers that Laidlaw has in, in you know, uh, working out crime. But I just, it felt very slight to me and quite and, and a bit throwaway which is no bad thing like sometimes what well, it is a bad thing to feel throwaway and that's not the nicest way of putting it because I do I've read a lot of Ian Rankin's Rebus novels and thought they were brilliant but this to me felt like it was just I don't know I just didn't gel with it like I wanted to and I wanted to care more um but yeah if you're looking for a quick fast thrill uh, and you and gangs don't bother you as much as they pee me there's certain things aren't there that tick you off with books I'm going to try and put my light on. One second, caller. Right, I'm going to carry on. You're going to have to excuse the slightly yellowy light, but if I put this on, I mean, that's too much, isn't it? Let's be honest. So we're going with this instead. Um, right, so next up was a book that I got on with a lot better, and that was Black and Blue by Palm Sandu. And um, this is one woman's story of policing and prejudice by former chief superintendent of the Metropolitan Police, Palm. You can see interviews with me and Ian Rankin, who, as I mentioned, is very, very lovely indeed. I just didn't love that book so much as others um, on the Sky Arts Book Club Facebook group, which I'll link down below always. Anyway, um, this I thought was incredible. This is all about Palm's life, both as going into the police and her career in the police, getting to the point of chief superintendent um, and the racism that she uh, faced and suffered from and yeah it's it's horrific but actually Palm reveals more about her life in general including um, uh, arranged marriage that she ended up in, how that went and lots of other difficulties that she's gone through which just leave you feeling like how do people keep going when so much is thrown at them but that's kind of what this book is about and it's kind of how Palm dealt with that and um, what I loved having interviewed her was she was like if this changes one person's life then that has done what I wanted this book to do and uh, it does so yeah it's absolutely incredible as is one of my favourite books of the entire year um, and that is the latest book club for the Frank book club which myself and Melanie Sykes co-host I will link down to it because they're no longer on my channel they're now over on uh, the Frank YouTube page we read Leave the World Behind by Ruben Alum, I'd heard amazing things about this and it was, I thought, absolutely incredible. It's about a family, I thought it was a couple that go and stay in an Airbnb outside New York um, for a sort of week away, but it's not, it's a family. Um, as they're going away, they know something's happened in New York, but they're not quite sure which, but they're going on holiday, so they'll get to it, you know, or they'll deal with it when they get back. Um, and then it's how things start to get a little bit more <laughs> ominous when like the TV and stuff stops working. And then there's a knock on the door. It's an elderly black couple who say they're in the house and they need to come to the house. Um, or they've had to come to the house because they're trying to escape from what is going on. I will say no more on the plot than that because I don't want to spoil it. Other than um, every fear you could think of pretty much somehow gets into this slight book. And I thought it was incredibly done like absolutely incredible and um, it made me so uncomfortable and so unsettled but not over I mean some of it like 
getting lost in dark woods was kind of creepy, but things like big flamingos just landing randomly in a swimming pool or seeing one deer, then two deer, then three deer, then thousands of deer. Um, or, you know, just like feeling like you've got lost on a road and you just keep going, keep going. Like that's something that you can really relate to. I haven't seen ginormous flamingo, it has to be said, or thousands of deer at once. Anyway, but it's how, it's how Room and Alan plays on fears that are kind of everyday, but also are extreme yet feel like they could be possible at the same time. So I just thought this was incredible. I absolutely loved it. I also look at the way it looks at class, it looks at race, it looks at so much. Um, yeah, I just think it's a book kind of about our times, almost at the end of times, but how the end of times might be an end of something, but what might follow on from that? Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just ace. Then a play that I read pretty much after seeing it because I thought it was so great. I needed to kind of relive it again and like sort of um, all the thoughts that it made me think I wanted to kind of mull over a little bit more, but interact with the text a little bit. And yeah, I just thought it was incredible. And that is um, If You Love Me, This Might Hurt by Matty May, who I adore. I have followed Matty May on Instagram for a really long time. I think he is wonderful um and yeah just phenomenal and this was a real it's a, a play all about their suicide attempts basically and 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 what what they've been through and how they've dealt with that and it's so frank and as someone who has been suicidal before i mean obviously the triggering subject matter within this um i'll keep it very light on here though but it it there were some things that Matty said that are deeply rooted in my experience that I found I haven't thought about or have hidden my thoughts on or have buried away or whatever. And it, it, it brought those up and confronted them, but in a very hopeful, human, genuine, warm, delightful, I don't know, this book in a really weird way feels like you want to give Matty the biggest hug while he is giving you the biggest hug with his honesty. That's the only way I can really describe it. I just thought it was incredible. So yeah, would recommend. Then I read a quick reads, um, The Baby Is Mine by Ian Braithwaite. I absolutely loved uh, my sister, the serial killer. Not quite as much as my mum did. My mum thought it was like one of the best books she's ever read. Um, I liked it a lot indeed. Um, but this I thought was as brilliant in just a very short condensed way. So it's about a man who's uh, cheated on his girlfriend. She finds out, she kicks him out. It's during lockdown in Nigeria. He goes to his aunt who's been widowed during the pandemic and she's not in a great state, but then also his uncle's mistress is there and there is a baby in the house, but they're both saying it's theirs, but could it actually even not be his uncle's? Could it be someone else's? Ooh. So um, yeah, it's very twisty um, in a really, really good way. Not like in a, in a, um, it's, it's that fine balance. It's like what I was saying about um, wanting slightly more twists in Where the Cruel Does Sing, but then this was twisty, but not in that kind of, there's so many twists, there has to be twists kind of way. It's not done in a, um, forced way. Um, it's just really cool. It's unsettling actually more than twisty. It's probably a bit more along the lines of this in some ways, I would say actually. Anyway, I thought it was brilliant. It's the second book that I've read about the pandemic and lockdown where I didn't think I'd want to read any or I wouldn't have thought that any would have been very good. But like Sarah Moss's The Fell, I just think this brings something really, it takes the pandemic and uses it to bring something kind of new to stories or new to, I don't know. Yeah, but that is basically it. Then I read the poetry collection Fontenelle by, oh, is that right? Fontenelle? Yeah, Fontenelle by Helen Shepard. Now, I picked this up in Bookhouse in uh, Bristol, where I was doing an event with Armistead Morpan and the day after I managed to get to a bookshop while I was there. And this was recommended by the staff and had been signed by the author. And it's absolutely brilliant. Helen Shepard is a, um, or has been a, midwife and is a nurse. It looks at childbirth, it looks at being a mother, it looks at having children, it looks at losing children, it looks at relationship with your body, it looks at the NHS and the pandemic, it looks at mental health and mental health of nurses. 
absolutely incredible and I've heard I don't think I've heard about this anywhere and I'm so pleased I did because I thought it was brilliant it's out from Burning Eye Books and I would really really recommend it I will link all of these books down below right penultimately I read Manifesto by Bernadine Everesto which is easily going to be one of my favourite books of the year one of my favourite non-function non or non-function I thought I was about to say sorry non-fiction it's non-fiction November not non-function November um but yeah I thought this was fantastic not only does it give you lots of insight into Bernadine's writing and where some of the ideas for some of her stories may have come from. Um, but really it's also about her and her life and how she has got to the point she has um, and up to the point it goes just past winning the booker really. Um, and it's about determination, it's about uh, positive thinking, it's about surviving when things are awful, it's about just gritting your teeth and getting on with stuff and determination and knowing that you can the knowing that you can get to where you want to get to basically and I guess that's kind of the and in a way actually I said it was a memoir but it's sort of not it's a little bit like I guess Bimini's book in the fact that really this whole book is kind of taking moments from a life lived up to now and taking all the learnings from it in lots of different ways. And I just thought that this was absolutely ace. Bernadine's Wonder. I'm just really annoyed this lighting isn't bright enough so that you can see how fabulous that cover is because it's a corker. And last but not least, the book that I read on the way to Edinburgh, uh, not this weekend, obviously the weekend before, um, and was two thirds of the way through reading Rizzio, um, which I actually picked up at the Gordon Byrne Prize. Denise Mina was the chair of the judges. And um, I had the pleasure of chatting to her and she was delightful. And I knew this was out and I thought, I'm gonna give this a whirl because I have read one Denise Mina before and I wasn't 100% on it. Um, but this, I just thought was brilliant. It's set on one night, I'm gonna get the directs get it wrong every time, 9th of March, 1566. And Mary Queen of is having dinner with her right hand man, Rizzio. Little does everyone know that there is going to be a coup and that they're going to try and kill Rizzio and try and take Mary off the throne. And the man at the helm of that, he thinks, is her husband. And you then get kind of in just this amount of book, bookage, um, you get a huge insight into how the relationship is between Rizzio and Mary, Queen of Scots, how the relationship is between Rizzio and her husband and what else might be going on there or have gone on there, but also how everyone's really a pawn of other people who kind of come in from the periphery as the book goes on. But what made it amazing was this takes place at Holyrood Palace in Edinburgh. And as I said, I was two thirds through um, when we got to Edinburgh and mum was like, shall we go to Holyrood Palace? And I went to the room where it happened and then read the rest of the book. Now I will say the way, it's not spoiled to say Rizzio dies, but the way Denise Mina writes it is so moving. It just take away the fact that I ended up in that room. I'd, I'd read the murder scene before then. I almost burst into tears on the train because you really care about him and you really get an essence of who he was um, through or, or Denise's imagining of him from, from the research that she's done that I found it moving. I don't know what happened there. My, my video literally stopped filming. So it feels like somebody doesn't even want me to make these videos at the moment. Anyway, and um, what I was saying was, um, I found the murder scene so emotional because you've learned so much of his character in so little text, but you really are, I don't know, to be, that was emotional enough, and then to be in, not using this term in the way that people now celebrate, but in the room where it happened, um, was even more emotional. So yeah, I just found this absolutely incredible. Um, a short, sharp punch of a Right, I don't know what's going on and it's almost like I'm jinxed not to do any more of these videos. So I shall finish off just by saying basically what a reading experience, both in terms of the book being incredibly emotional in a very short, sharp way, in a way that I didn't expect because it's a period of history I didn't really know about, and characters that I didn't know about apart from Mary Queen of Scots, but also to actually then go and be there was just incredible. So there we go. Right, there we go. My first wrap up in a long time. Maybe this is a sign that it should be my last. Hopefully you enjoyed it. I'm really sorry about the quality of the light as it went on. That wasn't expected. It wasn't expected it was going to go dark so quickly. But there we go. Anyway, uh, yeah, let me know if you have read any of these 
and what you thought of them. That would be lovely to hear. I will link them all down below if you want to go and find out more. And I will be back. I don't know what I'm going to be doing next because me and my mum might do a live from the Books in My Bag Readers Awards where we just do the whole behind the scenes. Literally, like I need to work out how I do a live on my phone, obviously with enough space, storage and lighting and all of those things, because that seems to be what's gone wrong today. Um, or whether I will do a pre-recorded video with her about book hibernation and how that's all going, because it is book hibernation at the moment. And we are hoping to do a live actually with oh, the author of The Wolf Den. There's the finished uh, version of it, which we're reading as the group read for um, Autumn Book Hibernation. If people are thinking, what on earth is Autumn Book Hibernation? It's just something me and my mum do where we get some uh, prompts and you go through your shelves, we go through our shelves and we pick books that match them and read them and chat about it on Twitter and Instagram and stuff. More Instagram than anything. Anyway, the prompts are, something's going on with my camera. Um, honestly, it's like the spirits have decided I should not make one of these videos. But the prompts, if you are wanting to join in with the final week of it, there is still time to do so because it goes until the 13th and now probably the 14th if we do this live with um, Elodie Harper, um, are a book with fall in the title, a book with an orange cover, a book with forests or woods on it, a cosy read, a book with a myth or legend retelling in it some way, and then the two extra prompts are a book with bonfire, fire, um, or either like as an image on the cover or the word in, or fireworks on it, or fireworks in the title, and um, something for non-fiction, as it's non-fiction November. Well, that one should be easy to do. Plus a picture of you reading in your favourite autumnal jumper in your favourite autumnal spot. So join in with all of that. The hashtag is Book Hibernation. I've done videos on it before. I'll probably do something on Instagram about it soon. I'm going to go. I need to edit this, get it live, and I'll speak to you all soon. Bye.